The Life of Crassus by Plutarch If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content. And now, on with the story. Marcus Crassus was the son of a father who had been censor and enjoyed a triumph, but he was brought up with his two brothers in a small house. His brothers were married in the lifetime of their parents, and all had a common table, which seems to have been the chief reason that Crassus was a temperate and moderate man in his way of living. Upon the death of one of his brothers, Crassus married the widow, and she became the mother of his children, for in these matters also he lived as regular a life as any Roman. However, as he grew older, he was charged with criminal intercourse with Licinia, one of the Vestal Virgins, who was brought to trial, the prosecutor was one Plotinus. Licinia had a pleasant estate in the suburbs, which Crassus wished to get at a small price, and with this view he was continually about the woman and paying his court to her, which brought on him the suspicion of a criminal intercourse, but he was acquitted by the Judases, being indebted in some degree to his love of money for his acquittal from the charge of debauching the Vestal. But he never remitted his attentions to Licinia till he got possession of the property. Now, the Romans say that the many good qualities of Crassus were obscured by one vice, avarice. But the fact appears to be that one vice, which was more predominant in his character than all the rest hid his other vices. They allege, as the chief proof of his avarice, the mode in which he got his money and the amount of his property. Though he did not at first possess above 300 talents, and during his first consulship he dedicated the tenth part of his property to Hercules, and feasted the people, and gave every Roman out of his own means enough to maintain him for three months. Yet, before the Parthian expedition, upon making an estimate of his property, he found it amount to 7,100 talents. The greatest part of this, if one must tell the truth, though it be a scandalous story, he got together out of the fire and the war, making the public misfortunes the source of his wealth. For, when Sulla took the city, and sold the property of those whom he put to death, considering it and calling it spoil, and wishing to attach the infamy of the deed to as many of the most powerful men as he could, Crassus was never tired of receiving or buying. Besides this, observing the accidents that were indigenous and familiar at Rome, conflagrations, and tumbling down of houses owing to their weight and crowded state, he bought slaves, who were architects and builders. Having got these slaves to the number of more than 500, it was his practice to buy up houses on fire, and the houses which were adjoining to those on fire, for the owners, owing to fear and uncertainty, would sell them at a low price, and thus the greatest part of Rome fell into the hands of Crassus. But, though he had so many artisans, he built no house except his own, for he used to say that those who were fond of building were ruined by themselves, without the aid of any opponent. Though he had many silver mines, and much valuable land, and many laborers on it, still one would suppose that all this was of little value, compared with the value of his slaves, so many excellent slaves he possessed, readers, clerks, assayers of silver, house managers, and table servants, and he himself superintended their education, and paid attention to it and taught them, and, in short, he considered that a master was mainly concerned in looking after his slaves, who were the living implements of domestic economy. And here Crassus was right, if, as he used to say, it was his opinion that he ought to affect everything by the instrumentality of slaves, and that he himself should direct the slaves. For, we observe, that what is economical with respect to things lifeless is political with respect to men. But he was not right in thinking and saying that nobody was rich who could not maintain an army out of his substance, for war feeds not by a fixed allowance, according to Archidamus, and, consequently, the wealth that is required for war is unlimited. And this opinion of Crassus was very different from the opinion of Marius, for when Marius, after giving to each man fourteen jugera of land, found that they wanted more, he said, May there never be a Roman who thinks that too little which is enough to maintain him. 
Besides this, Crassus was hospitable to strangers, for his house was open to all, and he used to lend money to his friends without interest, but he would demand it back immediately on the expiration of the time of the borrower, which made the gratuitous loan more burdensome than heavy interest. In his entertainments the invitation was usually to persons of the plebeian class and general, and the frugality of the banquet, which was accompanied with neatness and a friendly welcome, made it more agreeable than a sumptuous feast. In his literary pursuits he mainly studied oratory, and that kind which was of practical use, and, having attained an ability in speaking equal to the first among the Romans, he surpassed in care and labor those who had the greatest talents, for they say, there was no case, however mean and contemptible, which he approached without preparation, and often, when Pompeius, and Caesar, and Cicero, were unwilling to get up to speak, he would perform all the duties of an advocate, and for this reason he became more popular, being considered a careful man, and always ready to give his help. He pleased people, also, by his friendly and affable manner in taking them by the hand, and addressing them, for Crassus never met a Roman, however low and humble his condition might be, without returning his salute and addressing him by his name. He is also said to have been well versed in history and to have paid some attention to philosophy by studying the writings of Aristoteles, in which he had for his teacher Alexander, a man who gave a proof of his moderation and easy temper in his intercourse with Crassus, for it was not easy to say whether he was poorer when he became acquainted with Crassus, or after the acquaintance was made. He was, indeed, the only friend of Crassus, who always accompanied him when he travelled abroad, and he used to wear a cloak, lent him for the purpose, which on his return he was asked to give back. Oh, the submission of the man! For the poor fellow did not consider poverty among the things that are indifferent. But this belongs to a later period. When Marius and Cinna had got the upper hand, and it was soon apparent that they would reinstate themselves in Rome, not for the benefit of their country, but plainly for the destruction and ruin of the nobles, those who were caught in the city were put to death, among whom were the father and brother of Crassus. Crassus, being very young, escaped immediate danger, but, seeing that he was hemmed in on all sides, and hunted by the tyrants, he took with him three friends and ten slaves, and, using wonderful expedition, made his escape to Iberia, having been there before, when his father was praetor, and having made himself friends. Finding all in great alarm and trembling at the cruelty of Marius, as if he were close at hand, he did not venture to make himself known, but sought refuge in a tract bordering on the sea, belonging to Vibius Parchinus, where he hid himself in a large cave. He sent a slave to Vibius to sound his disposition, for the provisions that Crassus brought with him were now exhausted. On hearing the news, Vibius was pleased that Crassus had escaped, and inquiring about the number of persons with him, and where the place was, he did not go himself to see them, but he took his villicus near the spot, and ordered him to have food daily prepared, and to carry it and place it near the rock, and to go away without speaking a word, and not to be curious about the matter, or make any inquiries, and he gave him notice, that if he did meddle at all he should be put to death, but if he faithfully helped in the matter he should have his freedom. The cave is not far from the sea, and the precipices which shut it in leave a small and hardly perceptible path which leads into the cave, but when you have entered, it opens to a wonderful height, and spreads out wide, with recesses which open into one another, and are of a large circuit. It is also neither without water nor light, for a spring of the purest water oozes out at the base of the precipice, and there are natural clefts about that part where the rock closes, by which the external light is admitted, and in the daytime the spot is fully illuminated. The air within is free from all moisture caused by dropping, and is quite pure, owing to the compactness of the rock, which diverts all the wet and droppings to the spring. While Crassus stayed in the cave, the slave came daily to bring provisions, but he did not see the persons who were concealed, or know who they were, though he was seen by them, inasmuch as they knew, and watched the times of his coming. Now, the provision that was made for their meals was ample enough even for luxury, 
and not merely sufficient for their necessities. But Vibius determined to show Crassus every kind of friendly attention, and it occurred to him to consider the youth of Crassus, that he was a very young man, and that provision should be made in some degree also for the pleasures suitable to his age, and that merely to supply his wants would argue that he was serving Crassus as little as he could, rather than with hearty zeal. Accordingly, he took with him two handsome female slaves, and went down to the seacoast. When he came to the place, he pointed to the road that led up to it, and told them to go in boldly. Crassus, seeing them approach, was afraid that the spot was known, and had been discovered, and, accordingly, he asked them what they wanted, and who they were. The women replied, as they had been instructed, that they were looking for their master, who was concealed there, on which Crassus perceived the joke which Vivius was playing off upon him, and his kind attentions, and received the women, and they stayed with him for the rest of the time, telling and reporting to Vivius what he requested them. Funstella says that he saw one of these slaves when she was an old woman, and that he had often heard her mention this and tell the story with pleasure. In this way Crassus spent eight months in concealment, but as soon as he heard of Sinna's end, he showed himself, and out of the numbers that flocked to him he selected 2,500, with whom he went round to the cities, and one city, Malacca, he plundered, according to the testimony of many authors, though they say that he denied the fact, and contradicted those who affirmed it. After this he got together some vessels, and crossed over to Libya, to meet Ellis Pius, a man of reputation who had collected a force by no means contemptible. But he stayed no long time there, for he quarreled with Metellus, and then set out to join Sulla, by whom he was treated with particular respect. When Sulla had passed over the sea to Italy, he wished all the young men who were with him to aid him actively, and he appointed them to different duties. Crassus, on being sent into the country of the Marsi to raise troops, asked for a guard, because the road lay through a tract which was occupied by the enemy. Sulla replied to him in passion and with vehemence, I give thee as guards thy father, thy brother, thy friends, thy kinsmen, who were cut off illegally and wrongfully, and whose murderers I am now pursuing. Stung by these words, and pricked on to the undertaking, Crassus immediately set out, and, vigorously making his way through the enemy, he got together a strong force, and showed himself active in the battles of Sulla. The events of that war, it is said, first excited him to rivalry and competition with Pompeius for distinction. Pompeius was younger than Crassus, and his father had a bad repute at Rome, and had been bitterly hated by the citizens, but still Pompeius shone conspicuous in the events of that period and proved himself to be a great man, so that Sulla showed him marks of respect which he did not very often show to others of more advanced years and of his own rank, by rising from his seat when Pompeius approached, and uncovering his head, and addressing him by the title of Imperator. All this set Crassus in a flame, and goaded him, inasmuch as he was thus slighted in comparison with Pompeius, and with good reason, Crassus was deficient in experience, and the credit that he got by his military exploits was lost by his innate vices, love of gain and meanness. For, upon taking Tudorusha, a city of the Umbri, it was suspected that he appropriated to himself most of the spoil, and this was made a matter of charge against him to Sulla. However, in the battle near Rome, which was the greatest in all the war, and the last, Sulla was defeated the soldiers under his command being put to flight, and some of them trampled down in the pursuit. Crassus, who commanded the right wing, was victorious, and, after continuing the pursuit till nightfall, he sent to Sulla to ask for something for his soldiers to eat, and to report his success. But, during the proscriptions and confiscations, on the other hand, he got a bad name, by buying at low prices large properties, and asking for grants. It is said that, in the country of the Brutti, he also proscribed a person, not pursuant to Sulla's orders, but merely to enrich himself thereby, and that, on this account, Sulla, who disapproved of his conduct, never employed him again in any public business. However, Crassus was most expert in gaining over everybody by flattery, 
and, on the other hand, he was easily taken in by flattery from any person. It is further mentioned as a peculiarity in his character, that, though very greedy of gain, he hated and abused those most who were like himself. But Crassus was most annoyed at the military success of Pompeius, and his enjoying a triumph before he became a senator, and being called by the citizens Magnus, which means great. On one occasion, when somebody observed that Pompeius the Great was approaching, Crassus smiled, and asked, how great he was. But, as Crassus despaired of equaling Pompeius in military reputation, he entered upon a political career, and, by his activity, by pleading in the courts, and lending money, and by canvassing for candidates, and subjecting himself to all kinds of scrutiny in conjunction with those who wanted anything of the people, he acquired a power and reputation equal to what Pompeius had got by his many and great military services. And the result to each of them was something unusual, for, when Pompeius was absent from Rome, his name and his influence in the state, by reason of his military exploits, was superior to that of Crassus. But when Pompeius was at Rome, he often fell short of Crassus in influence, for his haughty temper and habitual pride made him avoid crowds and retire from the forum, and seldom give his aid to those who sought it, and then not readily, his object being to keep his power at a higher pitch, by exercising it only on his own behalf. But Crassus was always ready to make himself useful, and he did not keep himself retired, nor was he difficult of access, but he was always busy in everything that was going on, and by the general kindness of his behavior he got the advantage over the proud bearing of Pompeius. In personal dignity, in persuasive speech, and attractive expression of countenance it is said they were both equally fortunate. However, this rivalry did not hurry Crassus into any personal enmity or ill will, and though he was annoyed at Pompeius and Caesar receiving greater honor than himself, he never allowed this jealous feeling to be associated with any hostility or ill disposition. It is true that when Caesar was taken and detained by the pirates, he cried out, what pleasure you will have, Crassus, when you hear of my capture, but afterwards, at least, they were on friendly terms, and, when Caesar was going to Iberia, as praetor, and had no money in consequence of his creditors having come upon him and seizing all his outfit, Crassus did not leave him in this difficulty, but got him released, by becoming security for him to the amount of 830 talents. When all Rome became divided into three parties, that of Pompeius, Caesar and Crassus, for Cato had more reputation than power, and was more admired than followed. The sober and conservative part of the citizens adhered to Pompeius. The violent and those who were lightly moved, were led by the hopes that they had from Caesar. Crassus, by keeping a middle position, used both parties for his purposes, and, as he very often changed in his political views, he was neither a firm friend nor an irreconcilable enemy but he would readily give up either his friendship or his enmity on calculation of interest, so that within a short interval, he often came forward to speak both for and against the same men and the same measures. He had also great influence, both because he was liked and feared, but mainly because he was feared. Accordingly Sicinius, who was the most violent in his attacks on the magistrates and popular leaders of the day, in reply to one who asked, why Crassus was the only person whom he did not worry, and why he let him alone, said that he had hay on his horn. Now, the Romans were accustomed to tie some hay round the horn of an ox that butted, as a warning to those who might meet it. The insurrection of the gladiators and their devastation of Italy, which is generally called the War of Spartacus, originated as follows. One Lentulus Batiates kept gladiators in Capua, of whom the majority, who were Gauls and Thracians, had been closely confined, not for any misbehavior on their part, but through the villainy of their purchaser, for the purpose of fighting in the games. Two hundred of these resolved to make their escape, but their design being betrayed, those who had notice of the discovery, and succeeded in getting away, to the number of seventy-eight, took knives and spits out of a cook's shop, and sallied out meeting on the way with some wagons that were conveying gladiators' arms to another city. 
They plundered the wagons and armed themselves. Seizing on a strong position, they chose three leaders, of whom the first was Spartacus, a Thracian of nomadic race, a man not only of great courage and strength, but, in judgment and mildness of character, superior to his condition, and more like a Greek than one would expect from his nation. They say that when Spartacus was first taken to Rome to be sold, a snake was seen folded over his face while he was sleeping, and a woman, of the same tribe with Spartacus, who was skilled in divination, and possessed by the mysterious rites of Sionysus, declared that this was a sign of a great and formidable power which would attend him to a happy termination. This woman was at that time cohabiting with Spartacus, and she made her escape with him. The gladiators began by repelling those who came against them from Capua and getting a stock of military weapons, for which they gladly exchanged their gladiators' arms, which they threw away as a badge of dishonor and as barbaric. Clodius the Praetor was next sent against them from Rome, with 3,000 men, and he blockaded them on a mountain which had only one ascent, and that was difficult and narrow, and Clodius had possession of it, on all other sides there were steep smooth-faced precipices. On the top of the hill there grew a great quantity of wild vines, and the men of Spartacus cutting off all the shoots that were adapted to their purpose, and, intertwining them, made strong and long ladders, so that when fastened above, they reached along the face of the precipice to the level ground, and they all safely descended by them except one man, who stayed to take care of the arms. And, when all the rest had descended, he let the arms down, and, having done this, he got down safe himself. The Romans did not know what was going on, and accordingly, when the gladiators surrounded them, they were put in alarm by the surprise, and fled, on which the enemy took their camp. Many of the herdsmen and shepherds in those parts also joined the gladiators, men ever ready for a quarrel, and light of foot, some of whom the gladiators armed, and others they employed as scouts and light troops. Publius Baranus the Praetor was next sent against them, whose legatus, one furious, at the head of two thousand soldiers, the gladiators engaged and put to flight. Cosinus was then dispatched, with a large force, to advise with Baranus, and to be associated in the command. But Spartacus, watching his opportunity, while Cosinus was bathing at Salinae, was very near seizing him. Cosinus made his escape with great difficulty, and Spartacus, seizing the baggage, closely followed up the pursuit, with great slaughter of the Romans, and he took the camp. Cosinus also fell. Spartacus, after defeating the Praetor himself in many other battles, and at last seizing his lictors and his horse, now became great and formidable, but still he formed a just judgment of the state of affairs and, not expecting to get the advantage over the power of the Romans, he designed to lead his forces to the Alps, thinking that it was advisable for them to cross the mountains and to go to their several homes, some to Thrace and some to Gaul. But the gladiators, being strong in numbers, and confident, would not listen to him, and they went about ravaging Italy. The Senate were now no longer troubled merely at the humiliation and disgrace that they suffered by the revolt. But, moved by fear and the danger, they sent out both the consuls as to a war of the utmost difficulty and importance. Gellius, suddenly falling on the Germans, who, by reason of their arrogance and self-confidence, had separated from the troops of Spartacus, destroyed the whole body, and after Lentulus had hemmed in Spartacus with large armies, Spartacus, rushing upon them and joining battle, defeated the legates and got all the baggage. Spartacus now attempted to force his way towards the Alps, and Cassius who was the governor of Gaul upon the Padus, met him with 10,000 men, and a battle was fought, in which Cassius was defeated with great loss, and with difficulty made his escape. The Senate, on receiving this news, angrily bade the consuls keep quiet, and they appointed Crassus to the command of the war, whose reputation and popularity induced many of the nobles to serve under him. Crassus took his station on the frontiers of Picenum, with the view of waiting for Spartacus, who was moving in that direction, and he sent Mummius, his legatus, at the head of two legions, to make a circuit, and with orders to follow the enemy, 
but not to engage with them, nor come to close quarters. But Mummius, as soon as he got what he thought a favorable opportunity, fought a battle, and was defeated. Many of his men fell, and many, flying without their arms, made their escape. Crassus received Mummius himself roughly, and arming the soldiers again, he required of them security for their arms, that they would keep them, and five hundred, who had been the first to run, and had shown most cowardice, he distributed into fifty decades, and out of each decade he took one man, by lot, and put him to death, thus inflicting on the soldiers this ancient mode of punishment which had long fallen into disuse, for disgrace also is added to the manner of death, and many things horrible and dreadful to see accompany the punishment, in the presence of all the spectators. After inflicting this punishment, he made his men again face about and march against the enemy. Spartacus, however, avoided Crassus, and made his way through Lucania to the sea, and, falling in with some Cilician piratical vessels, in the straits, he formed a design to seize Sicily, and by throwing two thousand men into the island, to kindle again the servile war there, the flames of which had not long since been quenched, and required only a few sparks to set it again in a blaze. The Cilicians came to terms with Spartacus, and received his presents, but they deceived him, and sailed off. Under these circumstances, he marched back from the coast, and fixed his army in the peninsula of the Regian territory. Crassus now came up, and observing that the nature of the ground suggested what was to be done, he resolved to build a wall across the isthmus, for the purpose of keeping his soldiers employed, and cutting off the supplies of the enemy. Though the undertaking was great and difficult, he accomplished it, and completed the work, contrary to all expectation, in a short time, by digging a ditch from sea to sea, through the neck of land, 300 stadia in length, 15 feet deep, and as many wide, and above the ditch he raised a rampart of surprising height and strength. At first Spartacus paid no attention to what was going on, and treated it with contempt, but when forage began to fail, and he wanted to advance further into the interior, he discovered the lines of Crassus, and as there was nothing to be got in the peninsula, taking advantage of a night when there was a fall of snow and a wintry storm, he filled up a small part of the ditch with earth, and wood, and the branches of trees, and so carried over a third part of his army. Now Crassus was afraid that Spartacus might form a design to march against Rome, but he was encouraged by many of the followers of Spartacus quitting their leader, in consequence of some disputes, and encamping by themselves upon the banks of the Lake Lucanus, which they say is subject to changes, at certain intervals becoming sweet, and then again salt, and not potable. Crassus coming upon this band, drove them from the lake, but he was prevented from cutting them to pieces and pursuing them, by the sudden appearance of Spartacus, who checked the flight. Crassus had, before this, written to the Senate, to say that they ought to summon Lucullus from Thrace, and Pompeius from Iberia, but he now changed his mind, and made every effort to put an end to the war before they arrived, knowing that the success would be attributed to him who came last, and brought help, and not to himself. Accordingly, he determined to attack first those who had separated from the main body, and were carrying on the campaign by themselves, under the command of Cis Canisius and Castus, and he dispatched six thousand men, with orders to occupy a certain hill, and keep themselves concealed. The men of Crassus endeavored to escape notice by covering their helmets, but, being seen by two women, who were sacrificing for the enemy, they would have been in danger, if Crassus had not quickly appeared, and fought a battle, the most severely contested of all in this war, in which he destroyed 12,300 men, of whom he found only two wounded in the back, all the rest died in the ranks, fighting against the Romans. After the defeat of this body, Spartacus retired to the mountains of Petilia, followed by Quintius, one of the generals of Crassus, and Scrophus, his custer, who hung close on his rear. But, upon Spartacus facing about, the Romans were thrown into disorderly flight, and made their escape, after having with difficulty rescued their custer, who was wounded.
This success was the ruin of Spartacus, in consequence of the self-confidence which it infused into the slaves. They would not now consent to avoid a battle, nor yet would they obey their commanders, whom they surrounded, with arms in their hands, on the march, and compelled to lead them back through Lucania against the Romans, wherein they did the very thing that Crassus desired, for it was reported that Pompeius was now approaching, and there were not a few who openly said that the victory in this war belonged to him, for he would fight as soon as he arrived, and put an end to the campaign. While Crassus, therefore, who was eager to decide the affair by a battle, and to fix his camp near the enemy, was engaged in digging his trenches, the slaves came up to them and attacked the men who were at work. As fresh men from both sides kept coming up to help their comrades, Spartacus, seeing that he must fight, arranged all his army in order of battle. When his horse was brought to him, he drew his sword and said, that if he won the battle he should have plenty of fine horses from the enemy, and if he was defeated he should not want one, upon which he killed his horse, and then he made his way towards Crassus himself, through many men, and inflicting many wounds. But he did not succeed in reaching Crassus, though he engaged with and killed two centurions. At last, after those about him had fled, he kept his ground, and, being surrounded by a great number, he fought till he was cut down. But, though Crassus had been successful, and had displayed the skill of a great general, and had exposed his person to danger, yet the credit of the victory did not escape being appropriated to Pompeius. For those who fled from the battle were destroyed by him, and Pompeius wrote to the Senate that Crassus had defeated the slaves in the open field, but he had cut up the war by the roots. Now Pompeius had a splendid triumph for his victory over Sertorius and his exploits in Iberia, but Crassus did not venture to ask for the greater triumph, and even as to the foot triumph called the ovation, which he did enjoy, it was considered but a mean thing, and below his dignity that he had a triumph for a servile war. But how the ovation differs from the other triumph, and about the name, I have spoken in the Life of Marcellus. After these events, Pompeius was forthwith invited to the consulship, and, though Crassus had hopes of becoming his colleague, still he did not hesitate to solicit the assistance of Pompeius. Pompeius gladly listened to his proposal, for he was desirous in any way always to have Crassus his debtor for some obligation, and he actively exerted himself on behalf of Crassus, and finally he said, in his address to the public assembly, that he should feel no less grateful for the return of Crassus as his colleague than for his own election. They did not, however, continue in this harmony after entering on their office, but they differed on almost every subject, and quarreled about everything, and by their disputes rendered their consulship unfruitful in all political measures, and ineffectual. However, Crassus made a great festival in honor of Hercules, and feasted the people at ten thousand tables, and gave them an allowance of corn for three months. It was at the close of their consulship, when Pompeius and Crassus happened to be addressing the public assembly, that a man, not of any distinction, a Roman ex, a rustic in his mode of life, and one who did not meddle with public affairs, Onatius Aurelius, got up on the rostra, and, coming forward, told a dream which he had had, Jupiter, he said, appeared to me, and bade me tell the citizens not to let the consuls lay down their office before they have become friends. Upon the man saying this, and the assembly bidding the consuls be reconciled, Pompeius stood silent, but Crassus offering his right hand first, said, Citizens, I do not consider that I am humbling myself or doing anything unworthy of me when I make the advance towards goodwill and friendship to Pompeius to whom you gave the name of Magnus before he had a beard, and voted a triumph before he was a senator. These were the things worthy of commemoration in the consulship of Crassus. But his censorship passed over altogether without results, and without any active measures, for he neither revised the senate, nor inspected the equites, nor made a census of the citizens, though he had for his colleague Lutatius Catullus, the mildest of the Romans. 
but it is said that Crassus designed a shameful and violent measure to make Egypt tributary to the Romans, and that Catullus opposed him vigorously, on which a difference arising between them, they voluntarily laid down their office. In the affair of Catiline, which was a serious matter, and one that came near overthrowing Rome, some suspicion, it is true, attached to Crassus, and a man came forward to name him as implicated in the conspiracy, but nobody believed him. However, Cicero, in one of his orations, evidently imputed to Crassus and Caesar participation in the plot, but this oration was not published till after the death of both of them. But in the oration on his consulship, Cicero says that Crassus came to him by night and brought a letter which contained information on the affair of Catiline, as if his object was to establish the truth of the conspiracy. Now Crassus always hated Cicero for this, but his son stood in the way of his doing Cicero any open injury. For Publius, who was fond of oratory and of improving himself, was much attached to Cicero, and went so far as to change his dress when Cicero did at the time of his trial, and he induced the other young men to do the same. At last he prevailed upon his father, and reconciled him to Cicero. When Caesar returned from his province, he made preparations to be a candidate for the consulship, but, observing that Crassus and Pompeius were again at enmity, he did not choose by applying to one of them for his help to have the other for his enemy, and he did not think that he could succeed if neither of them assisted him. Accordingly, he set about reconciling them, by continually urging upon them, and showing that by their attempts to ruin one another they would increase the power of the Ciceros, and Catuli, and Cartos, who would lose all their influence if they would unite their friends and adherents, and so direct the administration with combined strength, and one purpose. By persuasion and effecting a reconciliation, he brought them together, and he formed out of the union of all three an irresistible power by which he put down the Roman Senate and the people, though he did not make Pompeius and Crassus more powerful, one through the other, but by means of the two he made himself most powerful, for immediately on being supported by Pompeius and Crassus, he was elected consul by a great majority. While Caesar was ably discharging the business of the consulship, Crassus and Pompeius, by procuring for him the command of armies, and by delivering Gaul into his hands, fixed him in a kind of Acropolis, thinking that they should administer the rest of the state as they mutually agreed, after securing to Caesar the authority which the lot had given him. Now Pompeius did all this through unbounded love of power, but to the old vice of Crassus, his avarice, there was now added a new passion, ambition for trophies and triumphs excited by the great exploits of Caesar, since it was in this alone that he was Caesar's inferior, for he had the superiority in everything else, and his passion remitted not nor diminished till it resulted in an inglorious death and public misfortunes. Caesar had come down from Gaul to the city of Lucca, and many of the Romans went to him there, and Pompeius and Crassus had private conferences with him, in which they agreed to take affairs in hand more vigorously, and to hold the whole power of the state at their disposal, to which end Caesar was to remain in his military command, and Pompeius and Crassus were to have other provinces and armies. To this object there was only one road, which was to ask for a second consulship, and Caesar was to assist them in their canvas by writing to his friends and sending many of his soldiers to support them at the Comitia. As soon as Crassus and Pompeius returned to Rome, suspicion was excited, and there was much talk through the whole city that their meeting had been held for no good. In the Senate Marcellinus and Domitius asked Pompeius if he intended to be a candidate for the consulship, to which Pompeius replied that perhaps he should, and perhaps he should not. Being asked again, he said that he was a candidate for the votes of the good citizens, but not a candidate for the votes of the bad. It was considered that Pompeius had made a haughty and arrogant answer, but Crassus said, in a more modest tone, that he would be a candidate, if it was for the interest of the state, if it was not, he would decline. This encouraged certain persons to become candidates, among whom was Domitius. However, when Pompeius and Crassus had openly declared themselves candidates, the rest were afraid and withdrew, 
but Domitius was encouraged by Cato, who was his kinsman and friend, and stimulated and urged him to stick to his hopes, with the view of defending the common liberties, he said, it was not the consulship that Pompeius and Crassus wanted, but a tyranny, that their conduct showed they were not asking for the consulship, but aiming to seize on the provinces and the armies. By such arguments, which were also his real opinions, Cato, all but by force, brought Domitius to the forum, and many sided with them. And those who were surprised at the canvassing of Pompeius and Crassus were no small number. Why then do they want a second consulship? And why do they wish to be colleagues again? And why will they not have the consulship with other colleagues? There are many men among us who are surely not unworthy to be colleagues with Crassus and Pompeius. This alarmed the partisans of Pompeius, who now abstained from no proceeding, however disorderly and violent. But, in addition to all the rest, they placed a body of men to lie in wait and attack Domitius as he was going down to the forum, while it was still dark, with his partisans, and they killed the man that held the light, and wounded many, among whom was Cato. After putting the party of Domitius to flight, and driving them back to the house, Pompeius and Crassus were proclaimed consuls. Shortly after, they again surrounded the Senate house with armed men, and, after driving Cato out of the forum, and killing some persons who opposed them, they procured another five years of administration to be added to Caesar's term, and the two provinces of Syria and Iberia to be given to them. When the lots were cast, Crassus got Syria, and Pompeius had Iberia. The result of the lot was not universally disliked, for the majority wished Pompeius not to be far from the city, and Pompeius, who was much attached to his wife, intended to spend his time chiefly in Rome. Crassus showed by his joy, immediately on the falling out of the lot, that he considered no greater good fortune had ever befallen him, and he could scarcely keep quiet before strangers and in public. To his friends he uttered many foolish and puerile expressions quite inconsistent with his years and temper, for he had never before shown himself in the least degree a braggart or arrogant. But now, being mightily elated, and his head completely turned, he was not for making Syria or Palestine the limit of his victories, but, designing to make the exploits of Lucullus against Tigranes, and those of Pompeius against Mithridates appear mere child's play, he extended his hopes as far as to the Bactrians, and the Indians, and the external sea. And yet there was no mention of a Parthian war in the law that was drawn up on this occasion. But everybody knew that Crassus was passionately bent on a Parthian war, and Caesar wrote to him from Gaul, approving of his design, and urging him to it. When it was known that Attius, the tribune, intended to offer some opposition to his leaving the city, and many persons joined him who complained that Crassus was going to make war upon a people who were doing the Romans no wrong, and had a treaty with them, Crassus in alarm prayed Pompeius to accompany him, and escort him out of the city. Now, the reputation of Pompeius with the multitude was great, and, by showing himself in front of Crassus, with cheerful looks and countenance, he tranquilized a numerous body of people who were prepared to obstruct Crassus, and to raise a shout against him, so that they made way and let him pass through them quietly. But Attius met Crassus, and, first of all, endeavored to stop him by words, and he protested against his marching out. In the next place, he ordered his attendant to lay hold of Crassus, and to detain him, but, as the rest of the tribunes would not allow this, the attendant courted his hold of Crassus, and Attius running to the gate, placed there a burning brazier, and, as soon as Crassus arrived, he threw incense and poured libations upon it, and, at the same time, he denounced against Crassus curses, in themselves dreadful and terrific, and, in addition thereto, he uttered the names of certain awful and inauspicious deities. The Romans say that these mysterious and ancient curses have great efficacy, that no man can escape upon whom they are laid, and that he who utters them also has an unlucky end, and, accordingly, they are not denounced either on ordinary occasions, or by many persons. Attius was blamed for letting loose such imprecations and religious fears upon a state, on behalf of which he was hostile to Crassus. 
When Crassus arrived at Brundisium, though the sea was still rough owing to the wintry weather, he would not wait, but he set sail, and so lost many of his vessels. After getting together the remnant of his forces, he marched through Galatia. Finding King Diotarus, who was now a very old man, founding a new city, Crassus said sarcastically, King, you are beginning to build at the twelfth hour. The Galician, with a smile, replied, You, too, Imperator, I observe, are not very early with your Parthian expedition. Now Crassus was past sixty, and he looked older than he was. On his arrival, matters at first turned out fully equal to his expectation, for he easily threw a bridge over the Euphrates, and got his army across safely, and he also obtained possession of many cities in Mesopotamia which surrendered. Before one of them, of which Apollonius was tyrant, he lost a hundred men, upon which he brought his force against the place, and, having got possession of it, he made plunder of all the property, and sold the people, the Greeks called the city Zenodosha. On the capture of the city, Crassus allowed his soldiers to proclaim him imperator, wherein he greatly disgraced himself, and showed the meanness of his spirit, and that he had no good hopes of greater things, as he was content with so slight a success. Having put garrisons in the cities that had surrendered, to the amount of 7,000 infantry and a thousand cavalry, he retired to winter in Syria, and there to await his son, who was coming from Caesar in Gaul, with the decorations that he had gained by his valor, and with a thousand picked horsemen. This seemed to be the first blunder of Crassus, or at least, it was the greatest blunder that he committed next to the expedition itself, for he ought to have advanced and to have secured Babylon and Seleucia, two cities which were always hostile to the Parthians, instead of which, he gave his enemies time to make preparation. The next thing the people blamed was his waste of time in Syria, which was employed more for purposes of money profit than for military purposes, for he did not occupy himself in reviewing the numbers of his troops, nor establishing games to keep the soldiers in exercise, but he busied himself about estimating the revenues of cities, and he was for many days with weights and scales in his hands among the treasures of the goddess in Hierapolis, and, after requiring from the towns and princes contingents of men, he would remit his requisitions for a sum of money, by all which he lost his reputation, and fell into contempt. The first sign that happened to him proceeded from this goddess herself, whom some consider to be Aphrodite, Venus, and others hear her, Juno. Others again believe her to be the cause that has supplied from moisture the seeds for all things, and nature, and the power that has pointed out the source of all good things for men. For, as they were going out of the temple, young Crassus first stumbled at the gate, and then his father fell upon him. While Crassus was getting together his forces out of the winter quarter, there came ambassadors from Arsax with a short message. They said, if the army was sent by the Romans, there was nothing but war without truce, and without any terms. But if Crassus, contrary to the wish of his country, as they heard, had brought arms against the Parthians and occupied territory for his private profit, Arsax would act with moderation and would take pity on the old age of Crassus, and give up to the Romans the men whom he had in his power, and who were rather under guard themselves than keeping guard over others. Crassus haughtily replied, that he would give an answer in Seleucia, on which Vagizes, the oldest of the ambassadors, smiled, and, showing the palm of his hand, said, from here, Crassus, hair will grow before you see Seleucia. The ambassadors now returned to High Roads to inform him that he must be ready for war. From the cities of Mesopotamia, in which there were Roman garrisons, some soldiers, who made their escape at great hazard, brought reports that caused much anxiety, having been eyewitnesses of the numbers of the enemy, and of their mode of attacking the cities, and, as is usual, they magnified everything which they reported. When the enemy pursued, they said, no man could escape from them, and when they fled, they could not be overtaken. That strange missiles preceded the appearance of the enemy, and before one could see who sent them, they pierced through everything that they struck, and as to the arms of the mailed soldiers, some were made to push through every obstacle, and others to give way to nothing. 
When the soldiers heard this their courage sank, for they had been led to believe that the Parthians did not differ at all from the Armenians and Carpadocians, whom Lucullus plundered and robbed till he was weary, and they thought that the hardest part of the war would be a long march, and the pursuit of men who would not come to close quarters, but now, contrary to their hopes, they were in expectation of a contest and great danger, so that some of the officers thought that Crassus ought to stop, and again submit to their deliberation the general state of affairs. Among these was Cassius the Custer. The seers, also, in gentle terms showed that bad and unfavorable signs were always prognosticated to Crassus by the victims. But Crassus paid no attention to them, nor to those who advised anything else except to move on. But Crassus was in no small degree encouraged by Artabazes, the king of the Armenians, who came to the camp with 6,000 horsemen. These were said to be the guards and attendants of the king, and he promised 10,000 men clothed in mail and 30,000 infantry, who were to be maintained at his own cost. He attempted to persuade Crassus to invade Parthia through Armenia, for, he said, the army would not only have abundance of provision in its march through the country by reason of him supplying them, but would also advance safely, having in their front many mountains and continuous hills, and ground unfavorable for cavalry, in which alone lay the strength of the Parthians. Crassus was well enough satisfied with the zeal of the king and the splendor of the proffered aid, but he said he would march through Mesopotamia, where he had left many brave Romans, Upon this the Armenian went away. As Crassus was taking his army over at the Zoigma, many extraordinary claps of thunder broke around, and many flashes of lightning came right in front of the army, and a wind, mingled with cloud and hurricane, falling on the raft, broke up and crushed to pieces a large part of it. The spot also, on which Crassus intended to encamp, was struck with two thunderbolts. A horse, belonging to the general, which was caparous and in splendid style, violently dragged along the man who held the reins, and plunging into the stream, disappeared. It is said also, that the first eagle which was raised, turned round spontaneously. Added to this, it happened that, as they were giving out the rations to the soldiers after crossing the river, lentils and salt were given first, which the Romans consider to be symbols of lamentation, and are accustomed to place before the dead, and, as Crassus was haranguing the soldiers, an expression escaped him which greatly alarmed the army. He said he would destroy the raft over the river, that no one among them might return, and though he ought, upon seeing the imprudence of his words, to have recalled what he had said and explained it to the soldiers, he neglected to do so, through his arrogant temper. Finally, when he was offering the usual expiatory sacrifice, and the priest had put the viscera into his hands, he threw them away, on which, observing that the standers-by were greatly disturbed, he said with a smile, such is old age, but no arms at least shall drop from its hands. After this he advanced along the river, with seven legions and nearly four thousand horsemen, and almost as many light-armed troops as horsemen. Some of the scouts now returned from their exploration and reported that the country was clear of men, and that they had fallen in with the tracks of many horses, which indicated that they had turned about and were retreating. This gave Crassus still better hopes, and made the soldiers completely despise the Parthians, who, as they supposed, would not come to close quarters. However, Cassius again had some conversation with Crassus, and advised him at least to give his troops rest in some of the garrisoned cities, till he should get some certain information about the enemy. But if he would not do this, to advance towards Seleucia along the river. He urged that the boats which carried the provisions would furnish them with supplies by stopping at the places of encampment, and that, by having the river as a protection against being hemmed in by the enemy, they would always be able to fight them on fair terms. While Crassus was considering and reflecting on these matters, there comes an Arab chieftain, Ariams by name, a cunning and faithless man, and of all the misfortunes that were by chance combined to ruin the Romans the chief and crowning mischief. Some of them who had served with Pompeius knew him as one who had received favors from Pompeius, and was supposed to be a friend to the Romans, 
but he now came to Crassus with a treacherous intent, and with the privity of the royal generals, to try if he could draw him far away from the river and the foot of the hills, into a boundless plain, where he might be surrounded by the enemy, for nothing was further from the intentions of the Parthians than to attack the Romans right in front. Accordingly, the barbarian coming to Crassus, and he was a plausible talker, spake in high terms of Pompeius as his benefactor, and praised the force of Crassus, but he blamed him for his tardiness, inasmuch as he was delaying and making preparation, as if he would have occasion to employ arms instead of hands and the most active feet, against an enemy who had long been trying to get together, as quick as they could, their most valuable property and their best slaves, and to move off to the Scythians or Hcanians. And yet, he said, if you intend to fight, you ought to press on before the king recovers his courage and all his forces are concentrated, for now Shurena and Silex have been thrown in your way to stand the attack, and the king is nowhere to be seen. But all this was false, for Hyrodes had at first divided his forces into two parts, and he was himself ravaging Armenia to take vengeance on Artavasts. But he sent Shurena against the Romans, not because he despised them, as some say, for it was not consistent for him to disdain Crassus as an antagonist, the first of the Romans, and to war against Artavasts and take the villages of Armenia, but it seems that he really feared the danger, and that he was on the watch to await the result, and that he put Shurena in the front to try the fortune of a battle, and so to divert the enemy. For Shurena was no person of mean estate, in wealth, birth, and consideration, he was next to the king, but, in courage and ability, the first of the Parthians of his time, and, besides all this, in stature and beauty of person he had no equal. He used always to travel, when he was on his own business, with a thousand camels to carry his baggage, and he had following him two hundred carriages for concubines, and a thousand mailed horsemen, with a larger number of light cavalry, escorted him, and he had in all, horsemen, clients, and slaves, no less than ten thousand. Now by hereditary right he had the privilege of first placing the diadem on the head of him who became king of the Parthians, and this very high roads, who had been driven out, he restored to the Parthian Empire, and took for him Seleucia the Great, being the first to mount the wall and to put to flight with his own hand those who opposed him. Though he was not yet thirty years of age at the time, he had the first reputation for prudent counsel and judgment, by which qualities particularly he caused the ruin of Crassus, who through his confidence and pride in the first place, and next through his fears and his misfortunes, became a most easy victim to fraud. The barbarian, after persuading Crassus, drew him away from the river, and led him through the plains by a track at first convenient and easy, but which soon became toilsome, for it was succeeded by deep sand, and plains treeless and waterless, not bounded in any direction by any object that the eye could reach, so that, not only through thirst and the difficulty of the march, was the army exhausted, but even the aspect of all around caused the soldiers to despond past all comfort, seeing neither plant, nor stream, nor top of sloping hill, nor blade of grass sprouting or rising through the earth, but a bare sea-like wave of desert heaps of sand environing the army. Now this of itself made the Romans suspect treachery. Messengers also came from Artavasts the Armenian, with a message that he was engaged in a heavy struggle since Hyrodes had fallen upon him, and that he could not send Crassus aid, but he advised Crassus above all things to change his route immediately, and, by joining the Armenians, to bring the contest with Hyrodes to a close, but, if he would not do this, he recommended him to advance, and always to avoid encamping in such places as were adapted for the movements of cavalry, and to keep close to the mountainous parts, to all which Crassus sent no written answer, but, under the influence of passion and perverse disposition, he answered, that he had no leisure at present to deal with the Armenians, but he would come at another time to punish Artavasts for his treachery. Cassius was again much dissatisfied, but he gave over advising Crassus, who was out of humor with him, though Cassius himself abused the barbarian. What evil demon, 
he said, vilest of men, brought you to us. And by what drugs and witchcraft have you persuaded Crassus to plunge his army into a boundless wilderness and an abyss, and to pursue a path more fit for a nomadic chief of robbers than for a Roman imperator? But the barbarian, who was a cunning follow, with abject civility, prayed him to endure a little longer. And, while running along with the soldiers and giving them his help, he would jeer at them in a laughing mood, and say, I suppose you think that you are marching through Campania, and you long for the fountains, and streams, and shades, and baths, and taverns. Have you forgotten that you are crossing the confines of the Arabs and Assyrians? Thus the barbarian amused the Romans, and before his treachery was discovered he rode off, not, however, without the knowledge of Crassus, after making him believe that he would serve the Roman army and put the affairs of the enemy in confusion. It is said that on the day Crassus did not appear, as is the custom of Roman generals, in a purple dress, but in black, which he immediately changed on observing what he had done, and it is also said that the men who carried the standards had much difficulty in raising some of them up, for they stuck in the ground as if they were firmly rooted there. Crassus ridiculed all these omens, and quickened his march, urging the infantry to follow after the cavalry, till at last a few of those who had been sent forward as scouts came up, and reported that the rest of them had been cut off by the enemy, and they had escaped with difficulty, and that the Parthians were advancing with a large force, and full of confidence. This threw all the army into confusion, and Crassus was completely confounded, and began to put his men in order hastily, and with no great presence of mind. At first, as Cassius recommended, he extended the line of the legionary soldiers as far as possible in the plain, and making it of small depth, in order to prevent the enemy from attacking them on the flank, he distributed the cavalry on the wings, but he changed his plan and, drawing his men together, formed them into a deep square of four fronts, with twelve cohorts on each side. By the side of each cohort he placed a body of horse, in order that no part of the army might be without the aid of the cavalry, but might make the attack equally protected on all sides. He gave one of the wings to Cassius, and the other to young Crassus. He himself took his station in the center. Thus advancing, they came to a stream called Bolicious, which was neither large nor copious, but it was a joyful sight to the soldiers in the midst of the drought and heat, and by comparison with the rest of their laborious march through a country without water. Now most of the commanders thought that they ought to encamp and spend the night there, and learn what was the number of the enemy, and the nature and disposition of their force, and so advance against them at daybreak. But Crassus, being prevailed upon by the importunity of his son, and the cavalry with him, to advance immediately, and engage with the enemy, gave orders for the men who required it to eat and drink in their ranks. And before this could be well accomplished all through the ranks, he led on his men, not slowly, nor halting at intervals, as is usual when men are marching to battle, but he kept them up to a quick, unbroken pace, until the enemy were in sight, who, contrary to expectation, did not appear to the Romans to be either numerous or formidable, for Shurena disguised his numbers by placing the mass of his force behind the front ranks, and he prevented their bright armor from being seen by ordering his men to cover themselves with cloaks and skins. But when they were near the Romans, and the standard was raised by the general, first of all they filled the plain with a deep sound and a terrific noise, for the Parthians do not excite themselves to battle with horns or trumpets, but they have hollow instruments, made of skin, and furnished with brass bells, on which they strike at the same time in various parts, and these instruments produce a kind of deep and dismal sound, compounded of the roaring of wild beasts and the harsh crash of thunder, for the Parthians rightly judge that of all the senses the hearing is that which causes the greatest alarm in the mind, and that, when this sense is affected, there is the speediest and greatest disturbance in the judgment. The Romans were startled at the noise, when all of a sudden throwing off the covering of their armor the Parthians appeared, with their helmets and breastplates flashing like flame, the Margian steel glittering sharp and bright, 
and the horses equipped in mail of brass and iron, but Shurena was most conspicuous of all, being the tallest and handsomest man among them, though his personal appearance, owing to his feminine beauty, did not correspond to his reputation for courage, for he was dressed more in the median fashion, with his face painted and his hair parted, while the rest of the Parthians, still keeping to the Scythian fashion, wore their hair long and bushy to make themselves more formidable. At first the Parthians intended to fall upon them with their long spears, and to drive the front ranks from their ground, but when they saw the depth of their close locked ranks, and the firmness and stability of the men, they drew back, and while they seemed to be at the same time dispersing themselves and breaking their ranks, they threw themselves around the square before the Romans were aware of it. Crassus ordered the light-armed troops to spring forward, but they had not advanced far before they were met by a shower of arrows, which galled them, and they ran back for shelter among the legionary soldiers, and caused the beginning of disorder and alarm among the Romans, who saw the vigor with which the arrows were discharged and their strength, for they tore the armor and made their way through everything alike, whether hard or soft defense. The Parthians, dispersing themselves at considerable distances from one another, began to discharge their arrows from all points at once, not taking any very exact aim, for the close and compact ranks of the Romans did not give a man the opportunity of missing if he wished it, but sending their arrows with vigorous and forcible effect from bows which were strong and large, and, owing to their great degree of bending, discharged the missiles with violence. Now the condition of the Romans was pitiable from the beginning, for, if they kept their position, they were exposed to be wounded, and if they attempted to close with the enemy, they were just as far from doing the enemy any harm, and they suffered just as much, for the Parthians while retreating still discharged their arrows, and they do this most effectually next to the Scythians, and it is a most subtle device to make their escape from danger while they are still fighting, and to take away the disgrace of flight. The Romans endured so long as they had hopes that the Parthians would withdraw from the contest when they had discharged their arrows, or would come to close quarters, but when they perceived that there were many camels standing there, loaded with arrows, and that the Parthians who had first shot all their arrows, turned round to the camels for a fresh supply, Crassus, seeing no end to this, began to lose heart, and he sent messengers to his son with orders to force the enemy to engage before he was surrounded. For the Parthians were mainly attacking and surrounding with their cavalry the wing commanded by young Crassus, with the view of getting in his rear. Accordingly, the young man taking 1300 horsemen, a thou sand of whom he had brought from Caesar, and 500 archers, and eight cohorts of the legionary soldiers, who were nearest to him, wheeled about to attack the Parthians. But the Parthians, who were manuvring about Crassus, either because they fell in with some marshes, as some say, or because it was their design to attack Crassus when they had drawn him as far as they could from his father, turned round and fled. On this Crassus, calling the Romans endured so long as they had hopes that the Parthians would withdraw from the contest when they had discharged their arrows, or would come to close quarters, but when they perceived that there were many camels standing there, loaded with arrows, and that the Parthians who had first shot all their arrows, turned round to the camels for a fresh supply, Crassus, seeing no end to this, began to lose heart, and he sent messengers to his son with orders to force the enemy to engage before he was surrounded, for the Parthians were mainly attacking and surrounding with their cavalry the wing commanded by young Crassus, with the view of getting in his rear. Accordingly, the young man taking 1300 horsemen, a thousand of whom he had brought from Caesar, and 500 archers, and eight cohorts of the legionary soldiers, who were nearest to him, wheeled about to attack the Parthians. But the Parthians, who were maneuvering about Crassus, either because they fell in with some marshes, as some say, or because it was their design to attack Crassus when they had drawn him as far as they could from his father, turned round and fled. On this Crassus, calling out that the Parthians did not stand their ground, advanced with Censorinus and Megabarchus, of whom Megabarchus was distinguished for courage and strength, 
and Censorinus was a senator and a powerful speaker, both of them companions of Crassus, and about the same age. The cavalry pursued the enemy, nor did the infantry allow themselves to be left behind, being full of alacrity and hope of victory, for they thought that they were victorious and in pursuit, but they had not gone far before they perceived the stratagem, for the Parthians, who were supposed to be flying, began to face about, and others, in greater numbers, joined them. Upon this the Romans halted, thinking that the enemy would come to close quarters with them, as they were only few in number. But the Parthians placing their mailed horsemen in the front, to oppose the Romans, rode about them with the rest of the cavalry dispersed, and, by trampling the ground, they raised from the bottom heaps of sand, which threw up such an immense cloud of dust that the Romans could neither see clearly nor speak, and, being driven into a narrow compass, and falling one on another, they were wounded and died no easy nor yet a speedy death, for tortured with violent convulsions and pain, and writhing with the arrows in them, they broke them in the wounds, and, by trying to pull out by force the barbed points, which had pierced through their veins and nerves, they increased the evil by breaking the arrows, and thus injured themselves. Many thus fell, and the survivors also were unable to fight, for, when Publius encouraged them to attack the mailed horsemen, they showed him that their hands were nailed to their shields, and their feet fastened right through to the ground, so that they were unable either to fly or to defend themselves. However, Publius cheering the cavalry, made a vigorous attack with them, and closed with the enemy, but the Romans were under a disadvantage, both as to attack and defense, striking with small and feeble spears against breastplates of raw hide and iron, and receiving the blows of long spears on the lightly equipped and bare bodies of the Gauls, for Crassus trusted most to them, and with them indeed he did wonderful feats. For the Gauls, laying hold of the long spears, and closing with the Parthians, pushed them from their horses, the men, owing to the weight of their armor, being unable to stir themselves, and many of the Gauls, quitting their own horses, and slipping under those of the enemy, wounded them in the belly, and the horses springing up through pain, and, at the same time, trampling on their riders and the enemy, fell dead. The Gauls were most oppressed by the heat and thirst, being unaccustomed to both, and they had lost most of their horses by driving them against the long spears. They were, therefore, compelled to retreat to the legionary soldiers, taking with them Publius, who was badly wounded. Seeing a sandy eminence near, they retreated to it, and fastened their horses in the middle, and closing in their front by close locking their shields, they thought they could thus more easily repel the enemy. But it turned out just the other way, for, while they were on the level ground, the front ranks did, in some sort, give relief to those who were behind, but on this spot, which raised the men one above another, by reason of the inequality of the ground, and placed every one who was in the rear above the man in front of him, there was no one who could escape, and they were all alike exposed to the missiles, lamenting their inglorious and unresisting death. There were with Publius two Greeks, who belonged to the dwellers in those parts in Curhai, Hieronymus and Nicomachus, both of whom attempted to persuade Publius to retire with them, and to make his escape to Inae a city which had taken the side of the Romans, and was not far off. But he replied that no death was so dreadful as to make Publius, through fear of it, desert those who were losing their lives for his sake, and bade them save themselves, and taking leave of them, he allowed them to go, himself being unable to use his hand effectually, for it was pierced by an arrow, presented his side to his shield-bearer and ordered him to dispatch him with his sword. They say that Censorinus perished in the same way, and that Megabarchus killed himself, and all the rest of the most distinguished men. The Parthians, ascending the hill, transfixed with their spears the survivors, and it is said that not more than 500 were taken prisoners. The Parthians, cutting off the head of Publius, immediately rode off to attack Crassus. With Crassus matters were thus. After ordering his son to make an attack on the Parthians, and receiving intelligence that they were routed to a great distance, and were hotly pursued, 
Seeing also that the enemy in front were no longer pressing on him so much as before, for most of them had crowded to the place where young Crassus was, he recovered his courage a little, and drawing his forces together, posted them on a sloping ground, being in immediate expectation that his son would return from the pursuit. Of those who were sent by Publius to his father, when he began to be in danger, the first fell into the hands of the enemy and were killed, and the next, after escaping with great difficulty, reported that Publius was lost, if he did not receive speedy and sufficient aid from his father. Now, Crassus was affected by many contending feelings at once, and he no longer viewed anything with sober judgment. Distracted by alarm for the whole army, and love of his son at the same time, he was urged by one motive to go to his aid, and by the other not to go, but finally he began to move in advance. In the meantime the enemy came up, making themselves more formidable by their shouts and peons, and many of the drums again bellowed around the Romans, who were in expectation of a second attack. The Parthians, carrying the head of Publius fixed on a spear, rode close up to the Romans, and, displaying it insultingly, asked who were his parents and family, for it was not decent to suppose that so noble and brave a youth was the son of so cowardly and mean a man as Crassus. The sight of this broke and unstrung the spirit of the Romans more than all the rest of their dangers, and it did not fill them with a spirit for revenge, as one might have supposed, but with shuddering and trembling. Yet they say that the courage of Crassus on that dreadful occasion shone forth more brightly than ever before, for he went along the ranks, crying out, Mine alone, Romans, is this misfortune. But the great fortune and glory of Rome abide in you, if your lives are saved, unbroken and unvanquished. And, if you have any pity on me, who have been deprived of the noblest of sons, show this in your fury against the enemy. Take from them their rejoicing, avenge their cruelty. Be not cast down at what has happened, for it is the law that those who aim at great things must also endure. Neither did Lucullus vanquish Tigranes without loss of blood, nor Scipio Antiochus, and our ancestors of old lost a thousand ships on the coast of Sicily, and in Italy many imperators and generals, not one of whom, by being first vanquished, prevented them from vanquishing the victors, for it is not by good fortune that the Roman state has advanced to such a height of power, but by the endurance and courage of those who meet danger. Though Crassus used such words to encourage them, he did not see many eager to follow his exhortations, but, by ordering them to shout the battle cry, he discovered the dispirited condition of his men, so weak, and feeble, and irregular a shout they made, while the cries on the side of the enemy were clear and bold. When the Parthians began the attack, their slaves and clients, riding about on the flanks of the Romans, galled them with their arrows, and the horsemen in front, using their long spears, kept driving the Romans into a narrow compass, except those who, to avoid death from the arrows, made a desperate attempt to rush upon the Parthians, wherein they did the enemy little damage, but met with a speedy death by great and mortal wounds, for the Parthians drove their spears, heavy with iron, against the horsemen, and, from the force of the blow, they often went even through two men. After thus fighting, as dark came on the Parthians retired, saying, that they allowed Crassus a single night to lament his son, unless he should take better counsel for himself, and choose rather to come to King Arsakes than to be taken. The Parthians encamped near the Romans, in high hopes. A painful night followed to the Romans, who neither paid any attention to the interment of the dead, nor care to the wounded, and those who were in the agonies of death, but every man was severally lamenting his own fate, for it appeared that they could not escape, either if they waited there till daybreak, or if they plunged by night into a boundless plain. And the wounded caused a great difficulty, for they would be an obstacle to the quickness of their flight if they attempted to carry them off, and, if they should leave them, their shouts would betray the attempt to escape unobserved. Though they considered Crassus to be the cause of all their sufferings, the soldiers still wished to see him and hear his voice. But Crassus, wrapping himself up in his cloak, lay concealed in the dark, 
an example to the many of fortune's reverses, and to the wise of want of judgment and of ambition, which made him dissatisfied unless he was the first and greatest among so many thousands, and think that he lacked everything because he was judged to be inferior to two men only. However, Octavius the Legate, and Cassius, endeavoured to rouse and comfort him, but, finding that he had entirely given himself up to despair, they called together the centurions and tribunes, and, after deliberating, they resolved not to stay on the ground, and they made an attempt at first to put the army in motion without the sound of the trumpet, and in silence. But when the soldiers who were disabled, perceived that they were going to be deserted, terrible disorder and confusion, mingled with groans and shouts, filled the camp, and this was followed by disorder and panic as they began to advance, for they thought that the enemy was coming upon them. After frequently turning from their route, and frequently putting themselves in order of battle, and taking up the wounded who followed, and then laying them down again, they lost much time on the march, with the exception of 300 horsemen, with Ignatius at their head, who reached Curhai about midnight. Ignatius, calling out in the Roman language to the watch upon the walls, and making them hear, told them to tell Coponius, the commander, that there had been a great battle between Crassus and the Parthians, and, without saying more or who he was, he rode off to the Zoigma, and saved all his men, but he got a bad name for deserting his general. However, the information thus conveyed to Coponius was some advantage to Crassus, for Coponius concluded that this hasty and confused message indicated that he who brought it had no good news to report, and, accordingly, he immediately ordered the soldiers to arm, and, as soon as he learned that Crassus was on his march, he went out to meet him, and, taking charge of him and his army, conducted them into the city. Though the Parthians during the night discovered that the Romans were making their escape, they did not pursue, but at daybreak they came upon those who were left in the camp, to the number of 4,000, and massacred them, and they rode about the plain and overtook many who were there rambling about. Four complete cohorts, while it was still dark, under the command of Vargantinus the Legate, got separated from the rest and lost their way, and, being surrounded by the Parthians on an eminence, they fought till they were all killed, with the exception of twenty men. The Parthians, admiring the courage of these twenty men, who were endeavouring to push through them with their bare swords, made way and allowed them a passage through their ranks, and to march slowly to Curhai. A false report reached Shurena, that Crassus and all the men of rank had made their escape, and that those who had fled to Curhai were a mingled rabble not worth notice. Thinking, then, that he had lost the end of his victory, but being still doubtful and wishing to know the truth, in order that he might either stay there and besiege the town, or leave the people of Curhai behind and pursue Crassus, he sends one of the men with him, who could speak both languages, with instructions to approach the walls, and in the Roman language to call out for Crassus himself or Cassius, and to say that Shurena wished to have a conference with them. The man did as he was ordered, and when it was reported to Crassus, he accepted the invitation, and soon after there came from the barbarians some Arabs who well knew Crassus and Cassius by sight, having been in the camp before the battle. The Arabs, observing Cassius on the wall, said that Shurena proposed a truce, and offered, if they would become friends to the king, to let them go safe, if they would leave Mesopotamia, for he considered this proposal advantageous to both sides, rather than to let matters come to extremities. Cassius accepted the proposal, and asked for a place and time to be fixed where Shurena and Crassus should meet. The men replied that this should be done, and rode off. Now Shurena was delighted at the Romans being besieged, and at daybreak he led the Parthians against the city, who, with many insulting expressions, bade the Romans, if they wished to have a truce, deliver up to them Crassus and Cassius in chains. The Romans were vexed at being deceived, and, telling Crassus to give up all hopes of aid from the Armenians as too remote and groundless, they prepared to make their escape by stealth, and none of the people of Curhai were to know this before the time came. But Andromachus, that most faithless wretch, heard of it from Crassus, who confided to him the secret, and also the guidance on the route. 
Accordingly, all was known to the Parthians, for Andromach just reported to them every particular. But as it is not the custom of the Parthians to fight in the dark, and indeed they cannot easily do it, and Crassus had left the city by night, Andromach just contrived that the Parthians should not be far behind in the pursuit, by leading the Romans first by one route and then by another, till at last he brought them out of their course into deep marshes and ground full of ditches, and thus made the march difficult and circuitous to all who followed him, for there were some who suspected that Andromach just had no honest object in turning and twisting about, and therefore did not follow. Cassius, indeed, returned to Kurhai, and when the guides, who were Arabs, advised him to wait till the moon had passed the scorpion, he replied, I fear the archer more than the scorpion, and, saying this, he rode off to Syria, with five hundred horsemen. Others, who had faithful guides, got into a mountainous country, called Sinaka, and were in a safe position before daybreak. They were about five thousand in number, and were commanded by a brave man, Octavius. But daybreak found Crassus exposed to the treachery of Andromachus in the unfavorable ground and the marshes. Crassus had with him four cohorts of the legionary soldiers, and a very few horsemen, and five lictors, with whom he got upon the road with great difficulty just as the enemy was falling upon him, and now being about twelve stadia short of joining Octavius, he fled to another hill not so difficult for cavalry nor yet so strong, but one that lay below Sinaka, and was connected with it by a long ridge, which stretched through the middle of the plain. His danger was apparent to Octavius, who ran before anyone else with a few men, from the higher ground to aid Crassus, upon which the rest of the men, abusing themselves for cowards, rushed forward, and, falling on the enemy, and repulsing them from the hill, put Crassus in the midst of them, and threw their shields before him, proudly exclaiming that there was no Parthian missile which should strike the Imperator until all of them had fallen in defense of him. Shurena observing that the spirit of the Parthians was somewhat dulled towards the contest, and, if the night should come on and the Romans get among the mountains, they could not by any means be overtaken, employed the following stratagem against Crassus. Some of the captives were let loose, who, in the Parthian camp, had heard the barbarians saying to one another, in pursuance of a concerted plan, that the king did not wish the war with the Romans to be carried to extremities, but desired to have their friendship again, by doing them the favor of treating Crassus kindly. Accordingly the barbarians stopped fighting, and Shurena, with his chief officers, riding gently up to the hill, unstring his bow, and holding out his right hand, invited Crassus to come to terms, saying, that Crassus had put the king's courage and power to the test, though the king did not wish it, and yet the king of his own free will made the Romans an offer of mercy and friendship by being ready to make a truce with them if they would retire, and by giving them the opportunity of a safe retreat. Upon Shurena saying this the Romans eagerly accepted his proposal, and were overjoyed. Though Crassus, having been always overreached by their fraud, and considering the suddenness of the change to be inexplicable, would not listen to them and hesitated, but the soldiers began to call out and urge him to accept the terms, and they fell to abusing and reproaching him, for wishing to expose them to the risk of fighting with those whom he did not venture to go to a conference with, even when they laid aside their arms. Crassus at first attempted to prevail on them by entreaty, and he said that, if they would hold out for the rest of the day, they would be able to march by night through the rough and mountain country, and he pointed out to them the route, and entreated them not to throw away their hopes when safety was so near. But, as the soldiers began to be exasperated and to clatter their arms and threaten him, he was alarmed, and advanced towards Shurena, after first turning round and merely saying, Octavius and Petronius, and you Roman officers who are here, you see that I go under compulsion, and you are witnesses that I am treated in a shameful way and am under constraint. But, if you get safe home, tell all the world, that Crassus lost his life through the treachery of the enemy, and was not surrendered by his fellow citizens. Yet Octavius and those about him did not stay behind, but descended the hill with Crassus. However, Crassus made the lictors who were following him turn back. 
The first who met them, on the part of the barbarians, were two Greeks of half-breed, who, leaping down from their horses, made their obeisance to Crassus, and, addressing him in the Greek language, urged him to send forward some persons, who, as they said, would see that Shurena himself and those about him were advancing without armor and without their weapons. Crassus replied, that if he had the least concern about his life, he should not have put himself into their hands. However, he sent two Rossi, brothers, to inquire upon what terms they should meet, and how many of them. Shurena immediately seized and detained the two brothers, and he himself advanced on horseback with the chief officers, and said, what is this? The Roman Imperator on foot while we are riding. And he ordered them to bring a horse to Crassus. Crassus observed that neither himself nor Shurena was acting wrong in coming to the conference according to the fashion of their respective countries, on which Shurena said that from that moment there was a truce and peace between King Hyrodes and the Romans, but that it was requisite to advance to the river, and there have the agreement put in writing, for you Romans, he said, have not a very good memory about contracts, and he held out his right hand to Crassus. When Crassus was going to send for a horse, Shurena said there was no occasion, for the king gives you this. At the same time a horse with golden bits stood close by Crassus, and the grooms raised him up and mounted him, and then followed, quickening the horse's pace with blows. Octavius first laid hold of the bridle of the horse, and, after him, Petronius, one of the tribunes, and then the rest got round the horse of Crassus, endeavouring to stop it, and dragging away those who pressed close upon Crassus on each side. This led to a struggle and tumult, and finally to blows. Octavius drew his sword and killed the groom of one of the barbarians, and another struck Octavius from behind and killed him. Petronius had no weapon, and, being struck on the breastplate, he leapt down from the horse unwounded, and a Parthian, named Pomaxephras, killed Crassus. Some say that it was not Pomaxephras, but another, who killed Crassus, and that Pomaxephras cut off the head and right hand when Crassus was lying on the ground. But these are rather matters of conjecture than of certain knowledge, for of those who were present some fell there fighting about Crassus, and the rest immediately fled back to the hill. Upon this the Parthians came and said, that Crassus had been punished as he deserved, but Shurena invited the rest to come down and fear nothing, whereupon, some of the Romans came down and surrendered, and the rest dispersed themselves under cover of night, of whom a very few escaped, the rest the Arabs hunted out, and put to death when they caught them. It is said that 20,000 perished in all, and 10,000 were taken alive. Shurena sent the head and hand of Crassus to Hyrodes in Armenia, and, causing a report to be carried by messengers to Seleucia that he was bringing Crassus alive, he got ready a kind of ridiculous procession which, in mockery, he called a triumph. One of the Roman prisoners who bore the greatest resemblance to Crassus, Cis Paxanus, putting on a barbarian female dress, and being instructed to answer as Crassus and Imperator to those who addressed him, was conducted, seated on a horse, and in front of him trumpeters, and some lictors rode upon camels, and there were purses suspended from the fasces, and, by the side of the axes, heads of Romans newly cut off. Behind these followed courtesans of Seleucia, singing girls, who chanted many obscene and ridiculous things about the effeminacy and cowardice of Crassus. All this was public. But Shurena assembling the Senate of Seleucia, laid before them certain licentious books of the Milesiarcha of Aristides, and, in this matter, at least, there was no invention on his part, for they were found among the baggage of Rustius, and they gave Shurena the opportunity of greatly insulting and ridiculing the Romans, because they could not, even when going to war, abstain from such things and such books. To the Senate of Seleucia, however, Sipasap appeared to be a wise man, when they saw Shurena with the wallet of Milesian obscenities in front of him, and dragging behind him a Parthian Sibaris in so many wagons full of concubines, in a manner forming a counterpart to those vipers and skytali so much talked of, by presenting the visible and the front parts formidable and terrific, with spears, and bows, and horses, but in the rear of the phalanx, terminating in harlots, 
and rattling cymbals, and lute playing, and nocturnal revels with women. Rustius, indeed, merits blame, but the Parthians were shameless in finding fault with the Milesian stories, for many of the kings who have reigned over them, as Arsacad, have been the sons of Milesian and Ionian concubines. While this was going on, Hyrodes happened to have been reconciled to Artavasts the Armenian, and had agreed to receive the sister of Artavasts as wife to his son Parkorus, and there were banquets and drinking parties between them, and representations of many Greek plays, for Hyrodes was not a stranger either to the Greek language or the literature of the Greeks, and Artavasts used to write tragedies, and speeches, and histories, some of which are preserved. When the head of Crassus was brought to the door, the tables were taken away, and a tragedy actor Jason, by name, a native of Trals, chanted that part of the back eye of Euripides which relates to a gave. While he was receiving applause, Silix, standing by the door of the apartment, and making a reverence, threw the head of Crassus before the company. The Parthians clapped their hands with shouts of joy and the attendants, at the command of the king, seated Silex, while Jason handed over to one of the members of the chorus the dress of Pentheus, and, laying hold of the head of Crassus, and, putting on the air of a backchant, he sung these verses with great enthusiasm, we bring from a mountain, a young one new killed to the house, a fortunate prey. This delighted all the company, and, while the following verses were being chanted, which are a dialogue with the chorus, a. Who killed him? B. Mine is the honor, Pomexephras, springing up, for he happened to be at the banquet, laid hold of the head, as if it was more appropriate for him to say this than for Jason. The king was pleased, and made Pomexephras a present, according to the fashion of the country, and he gave Jason a talent. In such a farce as this, it is said, that the expedition of Crassus terminated just like a tragedy. However, just punishment overtook Hyrodes for his cruelty, and Shurena for his treachery. Not long after, Hyrodes put Shurena to death, being jealous of his reputation. Hyrodes also lost his son Parkorus, who was defeated by the Romans in a battle, and having fallen into an illness which turned out to be dropsy, his son, Phraites, who had a design on his life, gave him aconite. But the poison only operated on the disease, which was thrown off together with it, and Hyrodes thereby relieved, whereupon Phraites took the shortest course and strangled his father. Thank you for watching. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content.